Hello and welcome to episode 32 of the Ford Progress Football Podcast. I'm your host, Zach Party, and today we're kicking off the AFC North and our Who Are They series with the Baltimore Ravens. Let's get on into it. Alright, so before we get on into it, first off, uh, in case you're watching this on video, yeah, my face is a little bit swollen. I was hoping the swelling from my wisdom teeth being pulled out would be gone by now, but you know, it is what it is. Um, so that's why my face looks a bit weird today. Um, also, we're getting closer and closer to that 100 subscriber mark that I said I wanted to hit by the beginning of the season. I definitely think that we can do it. So if you're watching this, in case you're new, go hit the subscribe button and help me reach that goal. Um, and also, in case you're new, what we do here is we go over each team position by position, breaking down the roster, and I just give you like my general thoughts about each position group. And then at the very end, I give a pessimistic and optimistic overview of what I think is possible to happen, as well as their floor and their ceiling. Um, I talk about the over-under of this of each team, whether or not I think that you should place that bet. And then I talk about the biggest strength and biggest weakness of the roster. At the end of the whole series, I'm going to be doing a season prediction where I'll give my official win totals for each team, as well as a se- um, an awards prediction where I'll give uh, predict who wins the MVP, Defensive Rookie of the Year, Defensive Player of the Year, all that, and then a playoff prediction. All right, and without any further ado, let's get on into today's team, which is going to be the Baltimore Ravens. So kicking things off, as always, with the quarterbacks, they have Lamar Jackson, Tyler Huntley, Brett Hundley, and Anthony Brown. So Lamar Jackson is one of the hardest quarterbacks to evaluate because the way he plays is just so different than everyone else. On one hand, he isn't the most accurate passer and only had 300 plus yards in two of his 11 full games last year. He also got injured last year, something which many are concerned about due to his running quarterback style. However, he was an MVP in his sophomore season and has over 4,000 ground yards in about three seasons worth of games. He's the most dynamic rushing quarterback in NFL history and the whole offense is designed around him as he has over a thousand more yards on design runs than he does on scrambles. Last year, Jackson and the Ravens were showing us that they can win in a more pass-heavy offense before facing Miami and then when he got injured a few weeks later. Now the Ravens are without Hollywood Brown, who is Jackson's most targeted receiver, even over Mark Andrews. They seem to be reinvesting in their 2019 style, a tight end heavy attack that hardly uses their wide receivers, and let's see if that can bring back this 2019 Lamar that we all fell in love with. Huntley is kind of like a light version of Lamar. He's an athletic quarterback who does a decent job at avoiding turnovers. He's a perfect fit here in Baltimore as if Lamar gets injured again, he knows the system well, now entering year three, and his skill set is close enough to Lamar where the Ravens wouldn't have to reconstruct their whole offense. He is going to be a restricted free agent by the end of the season, so I wonder if he'll get a decent contract to potentially be a starter somewhere else, or if the Ravens get to keep him as a solid backup. Hundley was taken in the fifth round out of UCLA in 2015. He's another plus athlete at the quarterback position, but didn't inspire any confidence of him being a starter when he stepped in for an injured Aaron Rodgers in 2017, completing 60% of his passes and throwing 12 interceptions to 9 touchdowns. And then Brown is a UDFA from this class. So at running back, they have J.K. Dobbins, Gus Edwards, Mike Davis, Tyler Beatty, Justice Hill, Nate McCrary, Rick Person, and then Patrick Ricard and Ben Mason at fullback. J.K. Dobbins looked great in limited action as a rookie, averaging 6 yards per attempt and finishing with 160 yards and 2 touchdowns against Cincinnati in the final game of the year. He missed last year though with an ACL tear, but looks set to start the season as the main back here. Dobbins fast and powerful running style combined with the threat of Lamar Jackson next to him is going to be a crazy backfield. If everyone can stay healthy this year, I wouldn't be shocked if they didn't finish as the top rushing team and Dobbins finishes as a consensus top 10 back in the league. Edwards also missed last year with a torn ACL. He's been a consistent back for the Ravens, averaging 5.2 yards per carry through his career and getting 700 yards each season from 2018 to 2020. He should be a good complement to Dobbins as a bigger bruising back who will get the tough yardage. Davis has been a decent backup throughout the years. 
He's shown that he can be a lead back in 2020 when McCaffrey went down with the Panthers, and he was good as both a runner and in the passing game. But then last year when he was signed to the Falcons to be their lead back, he couldn't step up and got far outshined by versatile weapon Cordero Patterson. Beatty is an undersized back taken in the 6th round this year out of Missouri. He was a good receiving back there, so I wouldn't be surprised if that was just his role here, especially early on with such a deep room. Hill can be this team's change of pace speed threat, if he makes the team. He is 4-4 speed, but hasn't really done much with it so far. Um, he could have had more opportunities last year, but just like seemingly every other player on the Ravens, he got injured, missing the whole year with a torn ACL. Then McCrary went undrafted last year, but he only got one carry, losing a yard. And Person is a UDFA from this season. Ricard is a big blocking fullback. For years, he also played defensive tackle for the Ravens, but now seems to only be focusing on fullback, and is one of the best blockers in the league, but doesn't really contribute much as a runner or pass catcher. Then Mason was taken in the fifth round by the Ravens last year. He bounced around a couple of practice squads before ending up back here in Baltimore, so we'll see if he can take Ricard's job or if he'll be like a backup or something this year. So for wide receivers, they have Rashad Bateman, Devin Duvernay, James Prochet II, Benjamin Victor, Jalen Moore, Tylen Wallace, Devin Williams, Makai Polk, Slade Bolden, Trayvon Clark, Shamir Bridges, and Riley Webb. So Bateman was taken in the first round last year out of Minnesota. He missed the beginning of his rookie season and didn't really have a dominant year, but he did have one 100-yard game. He's a good athlete with 4-4-3 speed and great route running. With the departure of Marquise Brown, Bateman will be tasked with being this team's number one, and I'll be pretty surprised if he wasn't able to step up to it. Duvernay is a fast, undersized slot receiver taken in the third round in 2020. With Brown no longer being here, I wonder if they'll work him more on the outside and have him take that deep threat role in year three. He hasn't been overly productive so far, but this offense doesn't really feature its wide receivers much anyways, so that could be part of it. Prochet was selected in the 6th round in 2020. So far, he's played mostly in the slot, but he is a reliable target, having only one drop so far, but that is also only on 23 targets. Him and Duvernay will be competing for the wide receiver 2 spot, and as the Ravens look to set up a really low number of 3 wide receiver sets, this could be a pretty big battle on to see a difference in um, snap counts. Victor and Moore both went undrafted in 2020, but neither played. And then Wallace was taken in the fourth round last year and hardly played. And then the last six of these guys are going to be undrafted free agents. There was a concerning lack of proven talent, and that's just like, it's just astounding how like unestablished this core is. Um, there were seven players last year who had more receiving yards in last year alone than the whole this whole team has in total career receiving yards at least in the wide receiver room because to be fair one of those seven players is on this team in tight end mark andrews who just absolutely went off and then speaking of tight ends they have mark andrews um, nick boyle charlie kolar isaiah likely josh oliver and tony Pollen. so andrews was the best tight end in the league last year and he has a real shot of repeating that performance again. Taken in the third round in 2018, he's been about the fifth best tight end or so these past couple years, maybe flirting with top three, but last year he put this team on his back and was the reason why they won multiple games. He was more reliable with his lowest number of drops, and he had 500 more yards than he had in 2019, which was Lamar's MVP season and his previous best. He should be heavily featured once again, but I also do wonder if in trading Brown and ignoring the wide receivers here, defensives will just be like, okay, let's double and triple team Andrews as he's the only threat and not really worry about anyone else beating them. Boyle earns his money by being a star blocker. He doesn't produce much as a receiver, but can catch a pass thrown his way if the defense is caught sleeping. He is also a huge reason for the success of this rushing attack and likely will continue to be so. Kohler and Likely were both drafted in the fourth round this year. Kohler was taken out of Iowa State where at 6'7", 250, he was a monster contested catch and ends on target. 
likely was taken out of Coastal Carolina. He's a smaller tight end who may need to bulk up, but he's a plus route runner and could be a nice long-term complement to Kohler if that's what they're setting up. Oliver was taken in the third round in 2019 by the Jags, but hardly played there due to injuries and poor performance. He was traded for a conditional 7th round pick, but only saw a few snaps per game for Baltimore and likely won't even make the roster this year. And then Poland went undrafted last year, but only saw a couple of snaps in one game. So for their offensive line, their projected starters are Ronnie Stanley, Tyree Phillips, Tyler Linderbaum, Kevin Zeitler, and Morgan Moses. With Patrick McCarry, Jared Jones-Smith, Daniel Falalele, and Jawan James backing up at tackle, Ben Powers, Ben Cleveland, and Cleo McKenzie backing up at guard, and Tristan Collin and Jimmy Murray backing up at center. Stanley has been the best pass protector for the Ravens since being taken 6th overall back in 2016. He missed most of 2020 and 2021 with an ankle injury, but if he can get back out there this year, he should help this passing offense immediately, as Lamar would hardly receive pressure from his blind side when he was in there. Macari went undrafted in 2019 and has filled in for injuries each year, playing at average or so level. While the Ravens clearly wanted to upgrade upon him, you definitely could do worse than Macari as your backup swing tackle. He also has a history of playing guard and center, so he can plug just about any hole if need be. And then Jones went undrafted in 2018, but only has two snaps so far, coming last year at right tackle. Phillips was taken in the third round in 2020. He hasn't looked great at guard or tackle so far, so it's no luck that he earns a starting gig here, as there will be other talented players vying for some playing time. Powers started much of last year at left guard after being taken in the fourth round in 2019. He came in to replace Phillips week one and held on to the job throughout the year, as when Phillips came back he moved to tackle, so I think it's very much an open competition between these two despite everyone listing Phillips as the starter for now. Landerbaum was one of college's greatest centers. He's a great athlete for the position and very powerful for his size. He played in a zone scheme that got him on the move a lot in college, which is going to be very different from the gap scheme that they run in Baltimore, which typically you want bigger centers where they just hit the guy in front of them for the most part. Um, I hope that they'll get creative with their run blocking as he is best when on the move and not just purely relying on the power as he is undersized and could be physically overwhelmed by some of these behemoth no tackles in the NFL, but I really do like the fact that they got him where they got him, um, pick 25 or whatever, because great value there, and I think the Ravens are creative enough where they will play to his strengths. And Colin went undrafted in 2020 and seen about a bit over 100 snaps each season so far, playing good for a young backup when given the opportunity. And then Murray went undrafted in 2018, but is yet to play. Zeitler has been one of the best guards in the league since being drafted at the end of the first round in 2012. He had a bit of a down year in 2020, which saw him get released by the Giants, but he's been a stud every year outside of that, including last year. Plus, he's hardly missed time with injuries throughout his career, but he is 32 years old, so that could be changing soon. Cleveland is the last player I could see competing for that starting left guard spot. He was taken in the third round in last year's draft and looked more comfortable as the year went on, uh, where he did start at left guard towards the end of the season. He's a plus athlete and the youngest of the guys competing, so I'm sure Baltimore would want him to win the job. McKenzie was taken in the sixth round in 2018 by the Chiefs and has practiced as both guard and tackle, um, defensive tackle, but so far he's only seen that action at defensive tackle. He is listed as a guard here though, so I guess they're going to be moving him back to offense, but we'll definitely have to see how he's played. And then Moses is a quality starting tackle, and he's been so ever since being taken in the third round in 2014. He may never provide like elite level play, but he's been consistent throughout his career and is a better run blocking than pass protector, which the Ravens can really lean into. Falele is a monster project tackle, someone who they definitely hope to replace Moses with down the line. At 6'8", 380, he was taken in the fourth round this year as a player with all the physical ability you want to see, you just need someone to coach it out of him. And there aren't many better coached teams in the league than the Ravens, so I really like Falalele's chances for success a few years down the line. James was a good tackle for Miami after being taken in the first round 2014. 
He then signed a monster contract with the Broncos, but only played three games with them due to injuries and then opting out of the COVID season. Now he's just hoping to stay healthy and make this Ravens roster. So for their interior defensive line, they have Calais Campbell, Michael Pierce, Justin Madubuike, Travis Jones, Brent Urban, Broderick Washington, Aaron Crawford, Isaiah Mack, and Rashad Nichols. Campbell has been one of the best pass rushers of his generation, taken in the second round in 2008 and still being a productive player last year. His best years were in Jacksonville, where he played on the edge more often, but he has still been efficient these past two seasons while on the inside with the Ravens. He will be turning 36 before the season starts though, so we'll have to wait and see how much longer he can keep this up for. Pierce went undrafted in 2016 and was a great run stuffing nose tackle for them. He then signed a big deal with the Vikings but hardly played there due to injuries and COVID. Now he's back with the Ravens where he should see success once again. Madu Buike was taken in the third round in 2020 and has shown some flashes of being a good pass rushing 3-5 to five tech type but hasn't yet put it all together. Travis Jones is a stud nose tackle prospect taken in the third round out of UConn. We'll see how often he sees the field as a rookie with Pierce ahead of him, but when he does get out there he should be a monster against the run and have enough power to be a pocket pusher in the pass game. Urban was taken in the fourth round in 2014 by the Ravens. He spent the past couple seasons bouncing around as a backup before finding his way back to Baltimore, where he'll likely see a couple hundred snaps in the rotation but won't be anything too special, you know? Washington was taken in the fifth round in 2020 and saw 200 snaps last year all along the defensive line. He didn't do much with those snaps, only getting one sack and eight run stops, so we'll see if he can do anything more, but there will be more competition in the room this year. Crawford went undrafted in 2020 and played a bit as a rookie, but not really at all last year. And Mack went undrafted in 2019 and has bounced around the league a bit, hardly playing, and Nichols is a UDFA from this class. So for edge defenders, they have Odafe Owe, Tyus Bowser, Justin Houston, David Ojabo, Dalian Hayes, Vince Beagle, Stephen Means, Jeremiah Moon, and Chuck Wiley. Owe had a great rookie season as a designated pass rusher, finishing with 49 pressures and 5 sacks. I fully expect him to get more snaps this year and to have more production, as the sky's the limit with him with his physical ability, and seeing him start to put it all together just as a rookie was incredible. Um, I definitely have hope that he can do even more in year two. Bowser has been good for the Ravens, seeing his most snaps last year and capitalizing off of them. He had 40 pressures and 8 sacks while also showing the ability to drop back into coverage, confusing the defense. I love the versatility he provides and I definitely think they can use him similarly to Zadarius Smith, lining him up in the middle too just to get as many good edge rushers on the field at once. Houston is getting up there in age, so I expect to see him mostly on passing downs to keep him fresh. When he is out there though, he can still be effective, finishing last year with 40 pressures and 6 sacks. Ojabo had an amazing upside, and I definitely think he can achieve it here. He tore his Achilles in the pre-draft process, so the second round pick out of Michigan may not play at all as a rookie, but he has all the physical traits that you'd want out of an edge rusher. Additionally, um, the defensive coordinator at Michigan last year is now the Ravens defensive coordinator, and Owe and Ojabo are childhood best friends. Um, the storyline just matches up perfectly, the fit's perfect here, and I just can't wait to see Ojabo get on the field and hopefully dominate. Beagle was taken in the fourth round in 2017 by the Packers, but only spent one year with them before being waived. He saw his most snaps in 2019 for the Dolphins, but has hardly played these last two years and now needs to fight to earn a spot here. Means was taken in the 5th round in 2013 by the Bucks and has bounced around the league as a backup. He saw a couple of snaps these past 2 years for the Falcons but didn't play well, especially last year where he had 11 pressures and 0 sacks off of 314 pass rush attempts. And Moon and Wiley are both UDFAs from this class. So for linebackers they have Patrick Queen, Josh Bynes, Malik Harrison, Christian Welch, Josh Ross, Zacoby McLean and Diego Fago. Queen was taken in the first round of 2020. He's shown some flashes as an undersized but extremely athletic linebacker, but is too often caught out of position in coverage and bullied against the run. 
He's also not a sure tackler, missing 18% of his tackle attempts, according to PFF. He'll make splash plays that give you hope that he can be a great linebacker, but he just needs to be more consistent. Bynes is almost like the opposite of Queen. He is smaller for a linebacker too, and but not as physically gifted. He is more consistent and definitely a better run defender than a coverage linebacker though. Ravens were hoping Harrison could be the complimentary piece to Queen when they drafted him in the third round of 2020. He's a full-size linebacker at 6'3", 245, and a good athlete for his size, but has hardly seen the field yet and hasn't looked well when out there. Welch went undrafted in 2020, but has hardly played yet outside of special teams, and Ross, McLean, and Fago are all UDFAs from this class. So for cornerbacks, they have Marlon Humphreys, Marcus Peters, Kyle Fuller, Jalen Armour Davis, Kevin Seymour, Eman Lewis Marshall, Demarion Williams, Robert Jackson, Denzel Williams, and David Vereen. Humphrey is a star cornerback who can play inside and out, giving him the ability to follow number ones around. He's great in coverage and against the run, and is amazing at forcing fumbles. Hopefully he, along with the rest of the team, can stay healthy this year, and they can be a great defense once again. Peters missed all of last year with a torn ACL, like many other Raven stars. He is a high-risk, high-reward man coverage corner who gets a lot of interceptions, but he can be caught jumping early and giving up a big play. Behind a good pass rush, though, here in Baltimore, he's been extremely effective, as if he does jump early, the quarterback may not even have the time to throw it on the double move as that pass rush is closing in. Fuller has been a great corner for the Bears since being taken in the fourth round 2014. However, he was surprisingly cut last season and then played poorly for the Broncos. He should see a lot of snaps here as a third corner, but he does have talented rookie Jalen Armour Davis breathing down his neck, so if last year was the beginning of his regression, he may be a backup sooner rather than later. Armour Davis was a lockdown corner for Alabama with sub 4'4 speed at 6 feet 200 pounds. However, he only started his redshirt junior season due to injuries and competition ahead of him. If he can stay healthy, I believe this coaching staff could bring the best out of him in a couple of years, but that's seeming like a big if. Seymour was taken in the 6th round 2016 and has bounced around the league as a backup. He made a couple of spot starts for the Ravens last year, but didn't look great doing so. Lewis Marshall was taken in the 4th round in 2019, but has hardly played, missing the past two seasons with ACL tears and most of his rookie season with another injury, so just like tragic for him. Williams was taken in the 4th round this year out of Houston, Jackson went undrafted in 2018 but hasn't played much yet, and Williams and Vereen are both UDFAs from this class. Alright, and then for safeties, they have Marcus Williams, Kyle Hamilton, Chuck Clark, Brandon Stevens, Geno Stone, Tony Jefferson, and Ardarius Washington. So Williams is infamous for giving up the Minneapolis miracle in his rookie season. But what many people may not have realized is he was one of the best safeties in the league that year. And once again, this was as a rookie. And since then, he has constantly played up to that level. Now he gets to go to Baltimore, which, if they can stay healthy, they're going to be one of the best defenses in the league, and he's definitely going to be a big reason why. Clark has been good for Baltimore as a six-round pick taken in 2017. He started for them these past couple seasons and has proven to be able to play both over top and in the box. He's a decent athlete who doesn't really do anything crazy good, but he doesn't do much bad either and it's just a like solid, unexciting safety who you can trust. But I'm so excited to see Hamilton in this defense. They will be running a lot of three safety sets just to get him on the field as a rookie. At 6'4", 220, who plays much faster than what he ran at the Combine, He's going to play all over, as an overtop free safety, a box safety, a slot corner, a linebacker, hell they might even line him up as an edge and just get completely wild with him. The Ravens have a history of taking these great athletes on defense and making the most out of them, and I believe Hamilton will just be the next one to benefit from this. Stevens was taken in the third round last year and started off as third safety, but saw his snaps go up and up as the year went on. He's a big and fast safety, so he'll likely play closer to the line of scrimmage a lot again, just like last year. But I also wonder how much he will get to see the field with two big investments brought in ahead of him, which kind of sucks as he looked good as a rookie, so it's going to be really interesting to see how they're rotated around. 
Stone was taken in the 7th round in 2020 and saw some action, including one start last year. The safety out of Iowa is really undersized at 5'10", 200, and only ran a 4'6", but he shows some good instincts and tries to make up for his physical deficiencies, but it is a question on whether he'll ever be able to do so and become a full-time starter. Jefferson has been in the league since 2013, but has lost his step these past couple of years. If he does make the roster, I don't really expect him to play, but be more so that veteran presence and leader in the locker room. And our Darius Washington was a great safety for TCU, playing in two high shells or in the slot. However, at 5'8", 170, with 4'6 speed, he went undrafted and barely played last year. He's kind of like a better version of Geno Stone, but with worse physical ability. If he can succeed in the NFL, it would most likely be from the slot, where he can cover up most of his physical deficiencies, but he definitely would need to add a bit more muscle, because defenses ask a lot of run support out of their nickelbacks. And for special teams, they have Justin Tucker at kicker, Jordan Stout at punter, and Nick Moore at long snapper. Um, probably the best unit in the league, not gonna lie, this is nasty. Tucker, he is the best kicker in the league maybe ever. He's made 91.1% of his field goals throughout his career, and last year broke the record for the longest kick with that crazy 66-yarder against Detroit to win the game. He's also only missed 4 of almost 350 attempted point-after tries. Stout was the first punter drafted this year, taken in the fourth round out of Penn State. This was sad as a SDSU fan because it definitely should have been punt god Matarizer. But all jokes aside, I'm sure he was highly drafted for a reason. Um, honestly, I don't pay much to attention to college punters outside my own, but I'm guessing based off of the Ravens' history of having good special teams and them drafting him so highly, that Stout's going to be a stud for them. And then Nick Moore joined the team in 2020 and was their full-time long stopper starting last year. All right, so now this is when I get into my season projection, talk about their over-under, um, their floor, their ceiling, everything that can go wrong, everything that can go right, and then what I believe is their biggest strength and biggest weakness. So starting off with their floor, I put it at 8 and 9, same as they went this year, just because I do think that they got more talented all around, um, but I definitely could see them not just taking that step up due to the receivers actually getting worse, that being the one position group, and then just relying on so many players to come back off of injuries. Um, like, what if they get injured again, or what if they just regress due to the injuries that's physically limiting them? Um, so, yeah. If not, then the talent here, I believe, is a minimum 10-win team. But, yeah, you just the, those injuries definitely do scare me. But outside of injuries, some other things that can go wrong include Lamar failing to be the, a top thrower of the football, especially with the lack of weapons he has to throw to. Like, he's going to be a stud running it. We all know that, but... He still needs to prove that he is a top thrower of the football. These running backs, they might not be as explosive coming off their injuries. Um, Bateman doesn't look like a number one in year two. It's definitely possible. And none of these receivers could crack 800 yards. That wouldn't surprise me, especially if Bateman. Like, Bateman is the one guy who I think can. Um, everyone else I don't think will. And if Bateman doesn't, then that's just like, damn. Um, Andrews, he could struggle with drops and being clutch, which has plagued him in the past. And then the rest of the rookies there, they can't step in and be dominant day one. This whole line, I think, should be fine outside of left guard, unless they struggle with injuries. And then rookie Tyler Linderbaum, he might get overwhelmed as a smaller center. This interior defensive line is reliant on the play of older players in Campbell and Pierce, who definitely could regress or get injured. And then it's also then would be reliant on younger guys who need to step it up. Their edge rushers have a lot of potential. But none of them did have over 50 pressures last season, and it is possible that none of them can become that true number one this year. These linebackers could struggle with Queen firing around like a loose cannon and Bynes looking older out there. And then the secondary, it, I think they should be good barring injuries, but they did have a lot of those last year, so we'll have to wait and see. And then optimistically, um, I definitely could see this team going on a run and repeating their 2019 success and being the number one seed in the AFC finishing with a 14 and 3 record uh, that is their ceiling like that would be I still would be a bit shocked to see them get there but it would be like okay that's like yeah definitely realistic especially seeing that they finished with the last place schedule last year um, and this team is just so different than any other team 
I could definitely see them winning any game in any week, especially if this offense is looking to recreate its 2019 tight end focused attack. If they can do that and get Lamar back to MVP level, this is going to be one of the best teams in the league. I also think this running back room is better than it was back then, and it's super deep, so they definitely can handle an injury or two, but not like 12 or however many they had last year. <laughs> they only do need one wide receiver to really step it up, and Bateman definitely has the ability to do that with Duvernay, Prochet, and whoever the hell else might step up and make this roster filling out nicely with like a couple catches a game. If Andrews can repeat last year, we need to talk about him as the best tight end in the league, and Boyle already might be the best blocking tight end. If one or both of these rookies step up too, this tight end room is going to be absolutely nasty. If this offensive line can't stay healthy, it should be more than good enough to execute this run-heavy attack that Baltimore loves. On defense, it's all about staying healthy and getting a couple of the younger guys to step up. If Campbell and Pierce can still produce, and then the youth on the inside can rotate nicely, I don't really worry about this group at all. I think Odafe Owe can have a monster year and enter the All-Pro conversation potentially, and this edge group could get a nice rotation going, especially if Ojabo can come in in the back end of this year. Hopefully Queen is able to rein it in a bit more and be a bit more consistent, and then these corners could be the best in the league as long as they stay healthy and Fuller can regain his bare form. And the same could be said of the safety room, especially if Hamilton hits the ground running. So looking at this over under, um, I just can't believe it's only nine and a half. Like, I feel like that is taking into account all the injuries that potentially could happen here. Because um, the AFC North it definitely is a bloodbath typically, but I could see them winning three to five games here due to the Steelers not looking too hot. And it also is depending on the whole Watson suspension with the Browns. They also start the season with the AFC East. Like, all four games to start off the season is that, which I saw that. I was like, what? Um, but I definitely could see them winning two, even three games there. Um, they play the NFC South, too, which I see as another two to three wins. Um, and then their last play schedule gives them the Giants, Jags, and Broncos, which... Giants and Jags, I would be very shocked if they don't beat, and Broncos, I definitely see them having the possibility to beat. Uh, if they can't stay healthy, I'd be extremely surprised if they go under the 9.5. And, and then their biggest strength I put as their secondary. I really hope that this secondary stays healthy and we get to see it at full force. It's just so well constructed, with a true number one corner who can play anywhere, and Humphrey, and possibly the best complimentary corner due to his turnover production, Peters, and then a cheap veteran coming in off a down year, but someone who has shown immense upside in Fuller. Add that to a great safety trio with Williams being one of the best center fielders in the league, Clark being nothing special maybe, but overall solid, nothing to complain about, and then Hamilton being one of the greatest collegiate safeties we've ever seen, and then adding in some of the younger guys like Armour Davis, Steven, Stone, like this. Oh, I love the way the secondary looks, and it could definitely has the chance on uh, them or Green Bay look like the best in the league. And similarly to Green Bay, their biggest weakness is their receivers. If this team gets in the shootout, I don't know if they have the firepower to keep up. Lamar hasn't proven to, to be able to win purely through the passing game, and these receivers are worse than he's ever had in the past, so there's no reason where he suddenly should show that ability. Um, sure, there is potential with all these guys. Um, there's a bunch of youth here that people can take a step up, but it's hard to look at this team that is so well-rounded outside of the receivers. You can clearly see that their plan is to run the ball and play great defense so that they don't need to rely on their receivers. Like, that's their... They didn't just, like, try to make a receiving core and it came out bad. They just purposely ignored it. But if other teams force them off their script, I don't know if they can reliably throw the ball. And that's obviously a concern in the playoffs. All right, so that's going to do it for today's episode. Thank you for sticking around. Um, if you liked it, hit the like, comment, subscribe. Um, also, thank you for putting up with, I, I know I've kind of been stumbling a bit more because my mouth's <laughs> swollen. Um, but yeah, if you're on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, leave a five-star review and stick around for another about a month or so. The NFL season's going to kick off and we're going to be talking about each and every game each week. I'll post a little... Um, clips for your individual teams too so you don't have to watch the full podcast make it a bit easier on you guys and yeah see you guys all next week